Well, my inspiration for today is a, a brand new book by one of my favorite authors. Do you know this guy here? Yeah. Bishop John Shelby Spong has a new book out. He's a retired bishop in the Episcopal Church. He's actually the former archbishop for the Diocese of Newark, New Jersey, which is a great big diocese. And uh, for most of his 82 years on this planet, he has been what I like to call a rebel without a pause. <laughs> Case in point, here's one of his books. Rescuing the Bible from Fundamentalism. A Bishop Rethinks the Meaning of Scripture. That's an interesting title. Now how about this one? This is even better. Why Christianity Must Change or Die. Do you think he got some interesting fan mail in response to these books? He actually he got, some, he got some death threats, as you might imagine. I mean, he was really stirring the pot. He has other books with, with, with similar titles. His mission in life has been really to transform traditional Orthodox Christianity. He likes to call himself, he calls himself a believer in exile. And he calls his audience the Christian Alumni Association. I love it. These are, these are people, these are people who no longer want to be associated with the label Christian. Um, for a lot of reasons, but because a certain brand of Christianity is being used and it's very visible, think of Westboro Baptist Church, for instance, the people that like to picket soldiers' funerals with things like, uh, you know, God hates you and things like that, that kind of thing, where Christianity is misused to promote prejudice, violence, uh, to justify marginalizing people, to... Uh, justify uh, censorship of scientific and intellectual freedom, things like that. And what happened was that a lot of people who uh, are part of this alumni association abandoned Christianity entirely. They gave up on it completely because they didn't think that there were any other ways of looking at it. That's what Bishop Spong set out to change. I happen to be a, a charter member of the Christian Alumni Association. This was back uh, back in the 90s. I was a charter member of that association when I first learned about Bishop Spong at the First Unity Church that I attended. This was back in Illinois. And uh, in the bookstore, they had all of his books that were out at that time. And I'll tell you what, I bought all of them and I read all of them. And it was like my eyes were opened. I had never looked at the the, 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 the label Christianity in that way before. I had never looked at Christian teachings that way before. His books do a masterful job of, of separating out the myth and the dogma about Jesus from the spiritual reality that was Jesus, that was the, the Jesus that people experienced. It was the spiritual reality that people found so compelling. All of that myth and dogma, that was added later by human beings. They did that to, to create a, a religious empire, so to speak, as a way to, to control people rather than liberate them. And as far as I'm concerned, a religion or a set of beliefs is useless unless it finds some way to liberate us. That's what it's all about. So I've used his books in classes over the years, and, and people have been astounded to find out that his way of looking at the life and teachings of Jesus have actually been around since the mid-1800s. This stuff isn't all that new. And it's only now, within the last 20 years, starting to be made available to people outside of the universities and seminaries. And uh, some people are actually kind of angry about that. One of the most common um, questions I get is, why didn't they teach me this in my... Lutheran, Presbyterian, Baptist Church, you know, you get it, you fill in the bank, blank. Why didn't they teach me this? And uh, I think the answer is that this kind of change can be threatening to people. And it takes time, it takes patience, and it takes some courage to actually put this out into the world and offer this, offer this to people. And of course, Bishop Spong has been staying the course with a great deal of patience and courage. And his most recent book is this one. It's called The Fourth Gospel, 
Tales of a, of a Jewish Mystic. I think it's only been out for a couple of months now. Um, the fourth gospel is the Gospel of John, which was the very last one of the four to be written. And it's been called the most mystical of all of the four gospels. And it was called that a long time before Bishop Spong wrote this book about it. Um, in fact, our co-founder, Charles Fillmore, has a, a book that he wrote that's called uh, The Mysteries of John. And uh, so this idea has been around for quite some time. And uh, before we go any further, maybe we ought to just stop and take a look at the word mystic. What does that mean? Language is a, is a tricky thing. And uh, you know, for a lot of folks, when they hear the word mystical, what it means to them is supernatural. Mystical is the same as supernatural. I don't believe in the supernatural, and it's not a core teaching of unity. I, I prefer to look at it this way. Reality is made of things that are tangible and intangible. They're made of things that are material and spiritual. It's made of the absolute and the relative, things that don't change and things that are subject to change all the time. So maybe we can look at mysticism as having a tangible experience of the intangible or of experiencing the absolute while we are still immersed in the relative because that's really the way it is you know as long as we have a body we're still immersed in the relative people throughout the ages who have had a mystical experience often describe it as an experience of of divine or ultimate reality something that actually goes beyond even the labels absolute relative spiritual material and things like that it, it's elusive it's very difficult to put into words and yet we keep on trying we sometimes get the mistaken impression that a mystical experience only happens to very religious people monks priests hermits and people like that well the truth is that it can happen to anyone at any time including all of us here in this room without any special training without having to go to any place you don't have to go to Tibet or India or anything like that it can happen to anyone at any time case in point a fellow named Rusty Schweikert, who was one of the Apollo astronauts. His mystical experience came on a spacewalk during the Apollo 9 mission. And I have a, I have a short video I want to show you now where he is going to uh, share that experience with us in his own words. Here we go. to do except just look at where I was 
No sound. Nobody was talking. Completely silent. And here, 17,000 miles an hour going across the surface of the Earth. Incredibly beautiful planet down below me. And I let I decided that this was the time when I really, my responsibility was simply to really let all that come in. What was happening? What was going on? And so all of a sudden, here I am looking, looking at this planet below me and saying to myself, here I am, a little farm boy from New Jersey, and, uh, and yet here I am in space. So all of these questions just came flooding flooding into my mind I mean, what am i doing here how did i get here what does this mean who am i what does it mean when i say i i mean this is this is really a very special thing with life moving out from the earth and that that's an amazing moment in the history of evolution so now all of that, I, I suppose I, I went too far because at that time all, all I was doing was just opening up to the experience. It was afterward that I began to really realize that the questions which came to me at that moment had a lot more in them and the experience fed those questions much more deeply than I ever analyzed at the moment. I didn't come up with all sorts of conclusions. I was just trying to open up to the experience. Yeah, the actual title to that is Rusty Schweikert Opens to the Experience. Yeah. I swear, we, I, I get here this morning at 9 o'clock, we run this thing and everything works just fine. <laughs> you know, it's just... Uh, it works just fine. Te technology it's is... What's that? It's the experience. Yeah, exactly. It's the, that, that's, that was part of the experience. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Wasn't it interesting there, toward the end, where he, he had to... He had to clarify the fact that the most important thing that happened was simply giving in to the experience. You know, the explanation, the contemplation, the reflection, the conclusions, all came, all came later. And, and, and in interviews that he does in other places, he talks about how in this experience, one of the overwhelming sensations that he had was of, of how the political divisions on our planet, you know, looking at the Earth from, there, from up there in space, the political divisions on our planet that mean so much to us when we're walking around down here faded away and disappeared entirely. He saw that the rivers and the clouds, they don't pay attention to borders. The oceans serve communist and non-communist countries equally. Other people have actually described this experience as an ocean of oneness, which is something that's totally opposite of the way that we experience the world in our ordinary waking consciousness. You know, most of the time we, we look at the world, we look at other people with this kind of a wary sense of, of separation. Probably part of our survival mechanism. You know, we wouldn't last very long if we weren't equipped to uh, accurately and rapidly decide between something that was good to eat and something that was going to eat us. Evolution. In fact, Rusty talked a little bit about evolution during that video clip. He was talking about the kind of evolution of consciousness that helps us to move beyond that survival instinct, those survival mechanisms that are based on separation. Evolution causes us to move beyond separation to see this, this bigger picture. You know, all through our evolutionary process, our technology advances. And as technology advances, what do we get a lot of times? How about weapons of mass destruction, right? Weapons of mass destruction are a dangerous threat to life on this planet when they're in the hands of people who see the world based on a sense of fear and separation. So this kind of evolution is critical to our survival. It's critical that we grow beyond our limited worldview based on our false sense of self and separation and fear. Okay, so how does this work into the teachings of Jesus? Well, even before evolution became a part of our vocabulary, you know, the great spiritual leaders of the world instinctively understood that we had to grow out of this sense of separation. 
And when it comes to the teachings of Jesus, the best place to see this is in the Gospel of John. At the start of his new book uh, on the Gospel of John, Bishop Spong admits that he was never a real big fan of the Gospel of John until he started reading it from the standpoint of Jewish mysticism. That's what opened it up for him. And if I had to pick just one passage that captures the mystical essence of what this Jewish mystic named Jesus was all about and was trying to get across to the world, it would be this one that we find here in chapter 17. I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me because of their testimony. My prayer for all of them is that they will be one, just as you and I are one. Father, that just as you are in me and I am in you, so they will be in us and the world will believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me so that they may be one as we are. I in them and you in me, all being perfected into one. That's some pretty profound stuff. I've read a lot of, I've read a lot of Buddhist sutras and... Uh, I'll tell you what, uh, uh, you know, they got nothing on this passage. So, Bishop Spong writes a, a commentary to this passage book. And in his commentary, he sums it up with just one word. Wait for it. There it is. Unity. Now, I don't think he's talking about the unity movement, although I'll tell you, Bishop Spong is one of our biggest fans out there. But uh, this is what he actually says. He says... He says, unity, the interconnectedness of life and love, brings together God and the human, the ground of being and being. Again and again, the fourth gospel drives home its point. God is not a distant <coughs> external entity. God is a life we enter, a love we share, the ground in which we are rooted. The call of Christ is not into religion, but into a new mystical oneness. We could actually take that whole commentary and put it on one of our little publications and say, yeah, this is what we're about too. Yeah. really sums up what we talk about in unity. God is not this, this distant external entity. God is a life we enter, a love we share, the ground in which we are rooted. This is new, and yet it's also very old. This idea of mystical oneness, you can find it going all the way back to this ancient Buddhist parable about the, the diamond net of the god Indra. Indra, the Buddhist god, had this, this net that encompasses the entire universe. And at each place where one strand of the net connected with another, there was a perfect multifaceted diamond. So you've got an infinite net with an infinite number of diamonds in it. And it's set up in such a way that if you look at just one diamond, you see the reflection of every other diamond that's in the net. And so it just follows that if you change one diamond, even slightly, you change every other jewel in the net. This is an artist's uh, depiction of the, of the net of Indra, which I've been using as the uh, background to my, uh, to my computer screen probably for the last 15 years. You know, if you just kind of sit back, you can kind of see the face of the Buddha in the background there, the eyes and the nose and the lips a little bit. This turns out to be a very accurate metaphor for reality, an infinite field of interconnected particles. Sound familiar? It has some basis in modern physics, actually. Everything in the universe in some way involves everything else in the universe. Now, do you think this has some serious implications for our interpersonal relationships? Yes. Big time. Big time. You know, there are some people who think that Jesus learned his version of oneness from a Buddhist teacher somewhere, and I've, I've never seen any convincing evidence of that. I, I prefer to think that it's maybe even more likely that anyone everywhere who can engage the spiritual path as deeply as Jesus and the Buddha did will find their own independent experience of this ground of being and this radical oneness that Bishop Spong and the Buddha and Jesus are all talking about here. No one can give it to us. No one can transmit it to us. We each have to di discover it in the core of our own being. And I can't give you an easy 
five-step process. I can't refer you to a, to a weekend workshop either. I mean, meditation helps, but what it really requires is a change in consciousness, which means we have to start catching ourselves when we start setting up the kind of arbitrary boundaries that we like to and the walls and things like that that always, always disappear when we see things from a higher perspective, like Rusty Schweikert did. It starts with the realization that this unity and this interconnectedness and this ocean of oneness is really the foundation of every single spiritual tradition on this planet. It may have been buried, it may have been misinterpreted, it may have been ignored by the powers that be, but it's, it's still there. It's waiting to be rediscovered so it can inspire us to reach for that next stage of development, that next stage of evolution that's going to be so important to our, to our survival as a species. And, and once we realize that, Maybe we can then start looking deeply at the simple events of daily life because that's where it has to start to see if we can begin to discern all of those threads, those invisible threads that are still there that, that, that tie everything together in this, in this net. It's really that simple. It's a personal journey that encompasses everything we do, whether it's making a cup of coffee in the morning or sitting down to a formal meditation practice. You know, the thing that I find truly inspiring about Bishop Spong's books is that um, he proves to us that our own spiritual, cultural heritage is not inferior to any other. Yes, we want to study other traditions, but we don't have to bash our own. It's not flawed. There is a richness there. Perhaps it was hijacked and misinterpreted, but one of the things that Bishop Spong does is inspires us to, to begin to reclaim it on our own terms and to see it as this, as this mystical awakening that's going to mean so many good and important things for our future survival on this planet. So let's get into it. See you next week.